OK。一人呢？嗯 ，OK。So yesterday we start introducing the topic of formal semantics and syntax and the relationship between syntax and semantics. OK。Um, and today we we continue with this. Okay, so we try to finish up this presentation, which is really to introduce one of the most important uh, issue about uh, our semantic competence, which is the one about our intuitions about the relation between different sentences and whether these intuitions are reliable. Okay, and then we'll have Mike telling us something about some different. Syntactic operations like the one that we that we chatted a little bit yesterday, but not exactly those operations, especially some that we that regard interpretation quantifiers, right? Which is going to be the hot topic of this uh, topic in linguistics class. So some syntactic and semantic operations that move and change the order of constituents in a sentence. Okay, but first let's 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 finish up this stuff. So if you're ready, I would start. And I think yesterday we were at the point where uh, someone, I think Kubra, asked whether we adopt one strategy or the other, or what is actually you know the the operations that we adopt during during uh, parsing and and uh, online interpretation of sentences. And my answer is that we don't really know. We don't really know if you compute all these derivations and then you choose them, or whether you just compute one of these. Okay, uh, in in classic um, in classical psycholinguistics, the difference was between uh, the so-called minimal commitment models, <coughs> when you would commit on one parse immediately and exclude the other parses from your working memory, let's say, or from your uh, online processing. Uh, um, routine or uh, full parallel models where you, where you have a parallel processing of different derivations of different parses at the same time and then it's a sort of a race model so it's like a race between different parses and those who are more uh, advantage or who have the higher activation or who are more probable or who are more likely are going to win at the end of the day and those are the ones that you will uh, that you will access consciously when you are reading the sentence okay and there is still debate about these things definitely we have some parallel processing going on and definitely we have some early filter that favors one or the other parts okay but this is again one of the recurring issues of our class Okay, so we saw this example about um, having. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Are you recording al already? Because I don't see it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I I didn't I didn't hear the question. Um, are you recording already? Yes. Or yes. All right. Yes. Because thank yesterday you. I've seen it. Today I don't see it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Do you see that I'm recording? Because you don't see that. I don't, but maybe it's just my device. That might be a problem. I can see it. It's being recorded. Yes, yes. Good, right. good. We're good. Thank okay, thank, thank you very you. much for reminding me. Okay, so, yeah, so if we, so if we, if we move to our slides, okay, we saw that at different level of, of your derivation, you have different meanings, right? And then to get the whole meaning, you have to go up, 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 at the IP or inflection phrase or fin P or TP, however you want to call it, and then you get the contribution of all the different constituents and phrases that are included in the sentence. Okay. Right. So again, compositional semantics, the the, um, the um, you know the, the, the simplest definition of compositional semantics is that is the one that is based on the idea that the meaning of complex expressions is composed from the meaning of simple expressions. And it also depends on the order and the structure of such, such process of compositions, okay? If you compose certain stuff before other stuff, you're gonna get different interpretation. Like if you compose with the binocular with the spy, you're gonna have one meaning. If you compose with the binocular with the act of watching, you're gonna have another meaning. 
Okay. Right. So, but then what is the meaning of a sentence for compositional semantics? Well, that's quite, that's quite simple. And the, the, the answer to this question is this. The meaning of a sentence is its truth conditions, which is the circumstances under which this sentence is true, okay? So you see that the two different interpretations have a different meaning, the one that we talked about yesterday. So the interpretation where we have a cop that watches an individual X such that the X is a spy and X has binoculars, right? is different from the meaning of a sentence where the cop is watching the spy using the binocular. That's quite easy to, to grasp. And if you don't believe me, right, here's one, for instance, one pictorial representation of the truth condition of the sentence, okay? Like a situation in which one of these representations is true, that you have a cop watching an alleged spy that has binoculars versus a cop using the binoculars looking at a spy, okay? And you see that if you have these two possible scenarios, only one of these meanings is true in one scenario and not true in the other scenario, right? So this is a usual trick that we play in semantics to explore uh, our intuitions about the meaning of the sentences, okay? We think about, for instance, a possible scenario or a state of affairs, and then we try to evaluate a sentence against this scenario. And we see that we have some quite solid intuitions about this, right? So, you know, this, if this is true, then it must mean that in our mind, we have something that allow us to go from uh, a set of strings or a set or, 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 or synthetic structures to actually an interpreted uh, representation, whatever that is, okay? And in compositional semantics, you, you refer uh, to um, a logic form as this kind of formula coding that can be used like with, for instance, with logical, symbols or just by spelling out the logic form like this, okay? And you have variables like x, and then you have, for instance, predicates on individuals, okay? Is this clear? Is there any question at this point? Good. So let's move on. So let's see if we can, uh, if we can come up with some interesting idea about semantic relations. So I give you two sentences, okay? One sentence is, Nick will bring vodka. The other sentence is, Nick will bring vodka and cigarettes, okay? Now I'm gonna ask you something about these two sentences. I will ask you to compare them to each other. And then I'm gonna ask you, what is the relationship, the relation between A and B with respect to their truth conditions, right? So is there any particular relation Oh, I give you the answer already. Okay, can you can you can you tell me if you if something pops out if uh, one of these two sentences tell you something about the truth of the other? Anyone? Well, um, you already showed the answer, but sentence B and tell, entails sentence A. So if Nick brings vodka and cigarettes, Nick also just brings vodka, so Nick brings vodka and Nick also brings cigarettes. So right. that would be like sentence A1 or something. But. Right. So let's, let, let me ask you some specific question. So if we know for sure, that um, that sentence A is true, right? For instance, we're talking about, we're wondering what our friend Nick is gonna bring to the party, okay? And I tell you, I know for sure that Nick will bring vodka. If I tell you this, does it follow from what I told you that Nick is gonna bring vodka and cigarettes? No, it doesn't. All right? We don't know anything about the cigarettes. I haven't no. mentioned that. 
and also, you know, we are not sure. But if I tell you Nick will bring vodka and cigarettes, does it follow that Nick will bring vodka? Yeah. Yeah, right? So this kind of relation is called logical entailment, which basically uh, equals to material implication, okay? If one of these sentences is true, the other one must be true as well, in any context, regardless of the situation in which you're evaluating the sentence, okay? And this is gonna be one of the most important relations that we are gonna use uh, in, our, in our class, okay? Right, so if B is true, then A is true as well. And it's also represented with this arrow, which is, stands for material implication, right? Now, tricky question. From, um, from what I told you, let's say that, uh, for instance, I tell you that I'm sure that B is false, okay? I'm sure that it is not true that Nick will bring both vodka and cigarettes, okay? From this, can you infer that A is true? or false, or anything. Just, just, just listen to your intuitions. If I tell you, I, I know for sure that Nick, is, Nick doesn't have a lot of money, so he's not gonna bring vodka and cigarettes, right? Can you infer that he won't bring vodka? Anyone? Yeah. One says no. I would say yes. Some, some people say yes. Zarko says yes, right? How is that possible? I just told you that there should be a systematic way to, to, to rely on our intuition, and we are already disagreeing the most in the simplest example, right? How is that possible? Well, I'm kind of playing tricks with you, right? So one of the problems about these guys, like this logical connective slice conjunction, is that, for instance, they are scopally ambiguous, which is one of the topics of this class. Or in, in other terms, you could also say that they are e e even ambiguous within their own meaning, okay? So the people who said yes, right? I think Zarko said yes, right? Up, you, um, interpreted this conjunction as Nick will, uh, will, Nick will not bring any of the two, right? So Nick will not bring vodka and Nick will not bring cigarettes, from which you can infer that Nick will not bring vodka. Whereas, uh, who, who, who else answered? Sorry, I, I, I cannot see the names. Um, I did. Yeah, Carolina, okay. Whereas Carolina said, uh, no, we cannot infer that because you interpreted the uh, conjunction as Nick will not bring both of them, right? Yeah. So you apply negation to conjunction. So a conjunction is true when both these junks are, well, that, when both conjuncts are true. And if you reverse this truth value, you get something really weak, which is that basically it's not true that both are true. So one can be false, the other one can be false, or both can be false, right? And from that, you cannot infer that, that Nick will not bring vodka or that he will bring vodka, right? So, I mean, we're going a little bit beyond that, but just to tell you that, for instance, this relation is also part of the, it's, it's kind of, it follows from the, from the meaning, from the truth condition of the material implication, okay? So if you know that B is true, then you know that A must be true. If B is false, who knows, right? That's, that's the truth table of conditional implication, right? But then if I tell you, uh, I don't know, if you wash my car, I give you 10 euros, okay? And then I ask you, what if, I, what if you don't wash my car? Am I gonna give you 10 euros? just based on what I told you? Intuitively? 
Anyone? I mean, uh, I mean, I might give you 10 euros because I don't know, you need money, but it's like intuitively, if I tell you that I give you 10 euros, if you wash my car, if you don't wash it, no way I'm gonna give you 10 euros, right? So now I'm violating what I just told you. Now I'm interpreting a real condition and in a real language by, the, the technical term is strengthening. So by making its interpretation a little bit stronger and turning it into a biconditional. And there, if you have a biconditional, if B is false, if you don't wash my car, then A is false as well. I'm not going to give you 10 euros, okay? So then, you know, you see that there is a lot of stuff going on when we interpret these words in the real world, okay, in the real use of language. But now we're just going to refer to these connectives at the logical level, okay? So at the logical level, and assuming that they are not going to do fancy scope operations, not A and B means that they cannot be true. Either one of them is false or they're both false, okay? And, and the B entails A, can only tell you that if B is true, A must be true. You don't know nothing in any other case, okay? Is this clear? This is very important. If you have doubts, please ask me now, okay? This is very, very important. No doubts. Okay, let's continue. Whoop. All right, so what if A is true? B can be true or false, depending on the subactor, right? So if B entails A, it does not necessarily follow that A entails B, right? This is called unilateral entailment. All right, let's play another trick. Let's substitute and with or, another logical connective, right? So if I tell you, I'll give you two sentences, Nick, we bring vodka. Or, for all I know, Nick will bring vodka or some tobacco. Okay? Is there any relation between these sentences? Now I'm not going to give you the answer. Well, if the or is inclusive, like Nick will bring vodka or tobacco or both, then it entails a if it's not, then. Yeah. Then uh, what entails what? B entails A, like before? Yeah. Okay. So let's say that if we are sure that Nick will bring either vodka or tobacco or both, then we are sure that Nick will bring vodka. Yeah. There, does everyone agree? No, I don't think so. It doesn't matter if it's inclusive or exclusive. So it's not only a probability. Yeah. Well, if the right. or is inclusive, then it's like, or both, then B is connected to A. If um, the or is exclusive, like vodka or tobacco, but not both, then. Okay. So, yes, but I still don't think that A is entailing B either way. I don't Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, so I stop you a second, okay? So let's assume, let's make things easier. Let's assume that or is inclusive, okay? Let's make this assumption. So B means that, uh, that I think that Nick will bring uh, either vodka or tobacco or both. I don't really know, okay? Uh, I mean, I know that he will bring something, but I don't know which one of the two or whether he's going to bring both. Okay. Now, if I tell, if I give you this meaning for B, right? If we know that what I'm saying is true because I'm telling the truth, so I have evidence to to know that Nick will bring something tonight at the party. Okay. Does it follow that I'm telling you that he will certainly bring vodka? 
No. No, right? So, I mean, I appreciate your guess, but it doesn't really work, right? Because it is not true that if we know that he will bring one of the two or both, but we don't know which one, then we know for sure that we'll bring vodka, right? Do you all see this? Other people can send me feedback. Up, thumbs up or, or, or make some noise. Okay, I see some thumbs up. Good. But now to show me that you understood, please, please, please answer me now, okay? So we, we, we established that, that if we know that B is true, we cannot really know whether A is true or not. What about the other way around? What if we know, what if I tell you for sure that I know that tonight Nick will bring vodka because I have seen him buying vodka with my own eyes, okay? If that is true, is it true that tonight Nick will bring either vodka or some tobacco or both? I would say yes, that's true. Um, I'm just thinking like if I said that, if I said B, I wouldn't be lying if I knew that he was bringing vodka. I don't think that's not lying, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds weird, right? Yes. Because when you use a disjunction in natural language, you are also expressing some sort of uncertainty or ignorance about what happens, right? But let's play the logic again, right? Uh, let's, let's set up a thing like uh, uh, something like, you know, um, I, I'm sure about what I'm going to do next holiday. I will go either to Morocco or to US, okay? And then it turns out that I went to US. Does this mean that the first thing that I said was, was true or I was saying some crazy thing that was false? It is true, right? Yes. So based on this, the two important questions that I'm going to ask you now are, is there a relations between these two sentences? And is, this, is it the same relation as we have seen before with conjunction? Or there is no relation at all? I mean, we have seen there is one, right? We've just seen it. If A is true, then B is true. Is it the same as before? Do you have the feeling that this junction is making this sentence logically stronger or logically weaker or neither of them? What do you think? Please tell me, tell me, tell me your feelings. Well, before it was the other way around, right? Yes. As he says, before it was the other way around. And I can show you the arrows just to convince you this, right? So when you have and, it goes from and to a normal sentence, just including one conjunct. When you have or, it goes from a normal sentence to the sentence with the, with the user, okay? So to check this again, let's try to make, to play with making one of these things false, okay? So if I tell you, okay, look, uh, tonight, tonight, Nick um, will not bring vodka or some tobacco. Will not bring vodka or tobacco, okay? That's not gonna happen. Can you infer that he want, that we will not bring vodka? Yeah, if yes. he will not bring vodka or tobacco, then he will not bring vodka. Right. And notice that now the, the disjunction sounds also way more felicitous, way more natural, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't have this problem about inclusivity, exclusivity. But if I tell you, I'm sure that he will not bring vodka because he doesn't drink anymore. 
does it follow that it will not bring vodka and tobacco or, or tobacco? No, right? It could still bring tobacco. So the pattern between disjunction and conjunction is exactly the opposite, okay? And right. So the important thing to notice is that this entailment relationship holds irrespective of the real state of affairs, okay? It does not depend on the way you evaluate these things. It's not, it does not depend on, on the probability of these events, okay? Of course, we tend to interpret things in natural language, thinking about their probability and thinking about how likely they are to happen. But if we put our mindset in a second, ignoring this kind of uh, vagueness and fuzziness of natural language and forcing us to interpret these words in their logical way, right? Then you see that there is a clear pattern that, that emerges. Now you might tell me, yeah, but this is not the right way we speak. This is not the way we interpret these words. We have ambiguity, we have vagueness, right? We're not, we're not like logical computers. We, we actually think about probability, thinking about how, whether the things that we think, why we said that, what are the motivations, what are the intentions, right? So this is precisely why we're having this class. Because we want to explore the relationships between certain logical, this, certain logical properties, certain logical principles, and the real way we use these things in natural language, okay? And what I will try to convince you during this course is that to some extent, our brain works as, um, as a logical processor, as a, as, a, as a deductive interpreter, okay? As a, as a theorem prover at some level. And then it's gonna refine the meaning of utterances by taking into account the context and other stuff, okay? Good, so let's go back to our, to our, to our semantic relationships, okay? So these relationships between uh, Nick will bring some vodka and Nick will bring some vodka or some tobacco, okay? It's called entailment. Entailment holds a priori, it's a logical consequence, okay? So that means that the relationship between these uh, two sentences is determined by the operators that we use in the sentence. Conjunction is called a strong operator and disjunction is weak, okay? And you've seen why. Um, okay, so is there any question at this point? Did I convince you at least a little bit that if you interpret these words, in, with, with their logical meaning, then you're gonna have this, then you're gonna have these intuitions. Or there is someone who is very skeptical and thinks that I'm saying a lot of crazy things. Did I convince you? Okay, well, a few thumbs. Good. I mean, I know it will take more to convince you, right? But this is just the beginning. All right. For instance, I could make you some more solicited examples, like taking, for instance, so when I wrote this slide, I think Silvio Berlusconi was the, was the prime minister. Now no one really cares about him anymore, but you know, still a funny guy to remember. So yeah, so if I tell you Silvio Berlusconi was murdered and Silvio Berlusconi is alive, okay? What do you think about these two sentences? Do they have some relation? Like, if one sentence is true, then the other one is false. Right. Do you know the name of this particular relation between sentences? It's called contradiction. Okay? Oh. These sentences are contradictory because they can never be true at the same time. Okay? And, you know, it's quite clear why, unless he's like Jesus Christ, and I think he kind of thought he was at some point, but if you're murdered, there is no way you can be alive, right? So they cannot be true at the same time. Contradiction, logical contradiction, okay? There is no situation that can, can satisfy the truth of both sentences, no matter what. However, if I tell you Silvio Berlusconi is both an idiot and not an idiot, kind of makes some 
sense, right? It's not so bad as the other one. Do you agree? So the reason why sometimes we do use contradiction, I mean, sentences that sound contradictory, is again the same reason as I was trying to tell you before why uh, we don't interpret if, for instance, as material imputation in the natural language, that we can add some, some fancy semantic operations, like, for instance, to say that there are some contexts in which Silvio Berlusconi is an idiot and some contexts in which he's not an idiot. Or he's an idiot for, from certain perspective, right? Like, for instance, putting pictures of dogs to, to make himself nice to people, but he's not an idiot in other, according to other perspective or in other contexts, for instance, when he made a lot of money by telling a lot of lies to Italian citizens, okay? So you see that, again, we can sort of um, restrict the interpretation of certain predicates by evaluating them in a certain context and play these tricks even within the same sentence, okay? Right. Okay. Let's continue. Dave is a bachelor. Dave is not married. What do you think about this sentence? Anyone? Um, Possibly not Caroline? Yeah. It's yeah. like they can be true on the, independently from each other. They can be true independently from each other, or they must be true. It's not a matter of must. It's it's like they're independent from each other. They don't. Um, what do you mean they're independent? Yeah, they both can be true at the same time, and it doesn't affect the meaning of the one if the other is not in either way, both ways. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's go to your, the first part of your statement, okay? So, you say that they both can be true. Yes. That kind of suggests they can also both not be true. Yes. Can Their you? meaning is like uh, independent from each other. It's like it, they could be a bachelor so, and not been married, but... Uh, right, so give me an example when they've... Uh, uh, so when, when these two sentences cannot be true at the same time. Pardon? Um, okay. uh, an example, if, so they are not true at the same time? Yeah. Like Dave is still studying and he is married. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> so, bachelor here is supposed to mean uh, not bachelor oh, student. Not, of, of course. I, uh, okay, but, but bachelor as a, 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 a married person, okay? <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. It's also my mistake, I guess, where we have uh, ambiguity uh, shown. <laughs> yes, yes. So, it's another kind of ambiguity called lexical ambiguity. So let's say that bachelor means, you know, the most natural meaning, the most like the, the, the primary meaning of bachelor is like not married, unmarried. Okay, okay? yeah, it's, so they're both true or both false. Right? Yeah. Do you all guys see this? So... If A is true, then B is true. If B is true, then A is true. There you go. Yeah. So if B is true, then A is true. And if B, A is true, if B is true, this, this relationship by two different sentences is captured by the logical term. They are equivalent. They are logically equivalent or uh, logically synonymous. Okay? the relation between these two sentences. And in particular, this is a biconditional. Okay? So, can we interchange interchangeably use A instead of B and convey the same informational content? So, in order to answer this question, if we can really use the two words interchangeably, let's apply a test, which is called a substitution test. Okay? Let's say Lina, Lina says, Dave is a bachelor. And B is, we just substitute bachelor with not married. So B is, Lina says, Dave, Dave is not married. Okay? Is this the same thing? Is this the same thing that Lina said?
in a way, yes, but if we want to be picky, no, right? Let's say, for instance, that Lina is like, uh, uh, like Gergana thought that bachelor meant something else. So she would never use the word bachelor. She would use the word not married, right? So you see that even if these two sentences have the same meaning, they cannot always use interchangeably in every context. Especially if they are embedded by certain verbs, like say, which reports a particular event of saying something, particular speaking event. Okay? You see this? Good. But then, if you have this in a, in a, in a, with the predicate like believe, for instance, Lina believed they is bachelor, Lina believes they is not married, you see that now they kind of tend to convey the same interpretation, right? There wouldn't be a, any appreciable difference if you, if you and me have the same uh, interpretation of bachelor. You see this? Okay. So yes, two synonymous sentences may not pass the substitution test in every context, okay? So you have to be careful. All right, moral semantic relations. So Francesco uh, is a colleague of mine in Rovereto, and uh, I give you these two sentences. Francesco went to San Francisco, and it was Francesco who went to San Francisco, okay? Do you think these two sentences mean the same thing? And why do you think about this and then get some more water? So, who thinks that these two sentences have exactly the same meaning? Thumbs up. Who thinks that these sentences mean something different? Thumbs up. Good. So, can any of you tell me what do you think the difference between these two sentences is? Anyone? I think that the first one is a fact, and the second one is like we are wondering who is the one who went to San Francisco, and right. then we realize that it was Francesco. Right. So if we were wondering who, who is the one who went to San Francisco, it means that we have a sort of a predetermined idea that someone went to San Francisco, right? Am I, am I right, Nisha? Uh, yes. Right? So you're saying that we had an idea, if we say B, that someone went to San Francisco, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, so this is Francesco and this is San Francisco. Uh, right, so are they synonymy, synonymous sentences? Well, you said no. It's, it's not really synonymy, the relationship between these two sentences, right? Uh, but still, if it was Francesco who went to San Francisco, then it is true that Francesco went to San Francisco, right? And if it is Francesco who went to San Francisco, then it is true that it was Francesco who went to San Francisco, right? So they, if, we, if we use the same test that we used before, we get that this sentence are synonymous. They're definitely mutually entailing. At least they look like. Do you see this? So how can we explore the, the nuances in their difference in, the, or in their interpretation? How can we address this in this question? There is another very useful test that, that, that semanticists use very often, which is a test of negation. Just take a sentence, put it under negation, and see what happens. If they have the same meaning, they're going to have the same meaning under negation as well, unless something crazy happens. Okay? If they don't, then there is something going on. So, if I tell you, it is not true that Francesco went to San Francisco. What do you know? 
well, Francesco doesn't go, didn't go to San Francisco. Maybe someone else went to San Francisco. Maybe no one went to San Francisco. Maybe San Francisco doesn't exist anymore, right? But if I tell you it wasn't Francesco who went to San Francisco, do you think that I, I'm still suggesting that someone went to San Francisco? Yes. Yes, right? That's crazy. Why doesn't that happen with A? Right? So we are kind of saying when we, when we deny D that there is one guy who went to San Francisco, that guy is not Francesco, and who, we're wondering who this guy is, right? So what this sentence conveys is that someone went to San Francisco, okay? This particular inference or this meaning relationship is called presupposition, okay? A sentence A presupposes B. If B must take him for granted, if, if B must be true in order for A to be even assertable. And you can see that very, very easily by denying A, if the presupposition survives, there you go. You know that there is a proverb, very probably that's a presupposition, okay? So what B presupposes is that someone went to San Francisco. Critically, A does not presuppose that because if you deny A, it is not true that Francesco went to San Francisco, you are not sure that someone went to San Francisco, right? For instance, you might say, it's not true that Francesco went to San Francisco, he went to New York, right? So you're not saying anything about other people going to San Francisco. Good. Now, to show you some, some fancy examples about presuppositions, right? We can play with different contexts. So for instance, we can say, um, who went to San Francisco? Still, I'm suggesting that someone went to San Francisco. I mean, my answer, no one went to San Francisco, right? So it's not as strong as in the previous examples. Uh, but if I tell you, if it was Francesco who went to San Francisco, I hope he brought us a gift. Does this sentence still suggest that someone went to San Francisco? Yes or no? Yes, right? So you see that even if you embed, the technical term is embed, your it cleft, that's the name of this sentence, this structure, within a conditional, the presupposition is still alive. In technical terms, we say it projects, okay? So this is, this is quite interesting. And also what is interesting is that you see whether we don't disagree anymore. We are very, very, we have some very solid intuitions about these facts, right? So I hope I, I managed to show you that it's, to some extent, we do possess a semantic competence that make us see these things all in the same way, okay? So it is always the case that there is someone who went to San Francisco, not with the WH question that much, but it kind of suggests that, right? At least according to one interpretation of this question. <clears throat> right, so we say they all presuppose that someone went to San Francisco. So the sum of moments went to San Francisco must be taken for granted in every context. Again, it doesn't really depend on the specific context. That's really, really a super strong inference that we derive in every context or that it must be true. And a good test to figure out whether a sentence A presupposes B is to check whether the negation of A, a question including A, conditional clause of in A or its antecedent presupposes B, okay? All right, let's play again with this stuff. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Nice. So my question is, do this sentence presuppose anything? There's a seagull talking to 
the owl on the roof. There's not a seagull talking to the owl on the roof. Is there a seagull talking to the owl on the roof? If a seagull is talking to the owl on the roof, I'm San Francis. Just intuitively, do you think this sentence presupposes something? And I tell you, yes, they do. So what do they presuppose? Do they presuppose that there is a seagull? No, right? Because B is saying that there is not a seagull. Do they presuppose that something is talking on the roof? Uh, not really, because D is a conditional, so we are saying that if the antecedent of the conditional can be false, right? Does it presuppose that I'm in San Francisco, that I'm San Francis? San Francisco? No, not really, right? Do they presuppose something about an owl? Yes. What? Please tell me. That there is an owl on the roof. That there is an owl on the roof. How many owls? One, two, three, four? One. We know that there's definitely one, right? And uh, yes, and also these sentences sound a little bit, now, right now when I told you these things, you were like kind of wondering what am I talking about, right? Because we haven't mentioned this bloody owl, right? So in order to make this sentence felicitous, I should have told you something like, look guys, now we're talking about my friend owl who is on the roof. I'm telling you that there is a seagull talking to the owl right now, okay? So this owl better be salient in the discourse, right? Unique, exists, and is salient. <coughs> right, there you go. There was an owl on the roof, but it was a fake one. Right, so there is an owl. It is salient in the context, and it is unique. There are no other owls in this context. Because if there were two owls and I would tell you there is a, so a seagull talking to the owl, you, you, you might be wondering, what the hell are you talking about, right? There are two owls. How do I know which owl you're referring to? You must be drunk, right? So, okay, so we, we sort of, uh, established that this little word, V, this very, very high frequency stupid word, which is called determiner uh, or definite determiner, is actually doing a lot of stuff. It's telling you at least three things, right? That the noun that it modifies is, must exist, like an individual of that kind must exist, it must be salient, and it must be unique in your context. Okay. All right, so let's go a little bit further and let's see, for instance, if uh, what happens when we add a disjunction, right? We, are, we just have seen that disjunction are a little bit strange. So if I tell you there is a seagull talking to the owl on the roof and maybe he's flirting with her, right? or there is a seagull talking to the owl on the roof, or I haven't digested the fried food I've eaten tonight. You see that there is something strange going on here, right? Because A just presupposes what we have seen before, but B seems compatible with the lack of this presupposition. When I'm adding this or sentence, I'm kind of telling you, look, I'm not really sure that what I said in the first sentence is actually true, right? So somehow by adding this disjunction, we managed to make the presupposition of there in the first sentence vanish. You see that, right? So we just said the presupposition resists to negation and everything. Why they are affected by this junction? 
Well, it turns out that this junction can be a sort of filter for quizzicals, right? So this is a big problem for people studying presupposition, and it goes under the name of presupposition projection. Okay. Now we're not going to use we're not going to talk about presupposition a lot in our class, but this is just to show you that there is there are these guys, there are these different inferences that we can derive, and 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 some of these inference, you know, pattern in a way which is quite predictable, and we kind of agree on how they work. Okay. There's a seagull talking to the owl on the roof, or there is no owl. Fine. It doesn't sound so crazy as uh, saying uh, there is a seagull talking to the owl on the roof, and there is no owl, right? It doesn't sound contradictory. So we say that this, the disjunct filters out the presupposition of the first disjunct, and it does not result in a contradiction. Okay? Right, and then you can formalize that with a definition. Right, so let's, let's see a couple of other meaning relations and then I think I'm good for today. And then we can have a little break and then uh, we can listen to what Mike has to tell us, okay? So what if I tell you, uh, so what, what, if, what if we have this little discourse where speaker A uh, uh, says, Francesco is a gourmet. And speaker B says, I've seen him eating mussels and fries. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I mean, I know you guys come from different countries, and in your country, maybe eating mussels and fries is a gourmet thing, but not in my country. Okay. <laughs> and I think not even here. <laughs> so, I don't know what what do you think about that, but I you know. Uh, do you have an intuition? Do you think that speaker B suggests like a, an affirmative or a negative answer to the question of speaker A? Anyone? Any any hands? Do you think there is any, any connection between the two sentences? Please. Shoot. Sam. So eating mussels and fries either means for the speaker B that it either indicates that it, he is a gourmet, but it could also indicate that he isn't. Right. By saying that, they tell us that it's either true or not, but I can't tell. Like, you know. Right. It kind of suggests, right? Yeah. So if I show you this, maybe you're going to make a clear idea of the fact that it's not really a gourmet thing, eating masses and fries. But you see that the utterance of speaker B does not directly address the question, right? So sometimes people ask us stuff, and we kind of answer with something that suggests something to the answer, but we don't, we don't directly express the answer, right? This is a case of context-based implicature, right? So as Darko said, you know, depending on your knowledge or on the context or what you think about doing this stuff, uh, you might think that this is, a, you know, uh, uh, like an affirmative answer or, a, or a negative answer to the question of speaker A, right? So you need to do some work. You need to derive some inference based on the context, based on what you know, and then you actually find the link between two sentences. But it's not as strong as, the, as what we have seen before, right? This is called implicature. And we are going to talk a lot about that, not about the specific implicature. Right, so the pragmatic reasoning that you, uh, that you perform in order to connect these two sentences is, I've seen him eating mussels and fries. It's a very weird combination, not really refined. Therefore, Francesco is not a good man, right? So this is very, very similar to what Darko said. Thanks, Darko. Yeah, so it's a suggested inference by speaker B. Okay. Last one, and then I will leave you for five minutes. Uh, if I tell you, 
if John parked two cars in the garage, he won't park a motorcycle in the courtyard. Okay. And then it tell you, what if John has parked three cars in the garage? Is he going to park a motorcycle in the courtyard? Who says yes? Raise your thumb. Who says no? Raise your thumb. Good. So, I mean, I was hoping you would say yes. <laughs> but <laughs> so at least one person. I say yes, okay? <laughs> so yes. So by you said no because you interpreted two in this sentence as exactly two, okay? So, you know, if you know that if what I told you is that he's going to park exactly two cars in the garage, then he won't park a motorcycle. But you don't really know about what happens if he parks three cars in the garage, okay? But I interpreted two as at least two. And I'm sure that if you make some work, you can get this interpretation as well, right? Especially if we say that the garage is small. You cannot fit more than uh, three cars or two cars and a motorcycle. Then you see that this sentence can be felicitous if you interpret two as at least two. And then you would say no. If you park three cars in the garage, um, he won't park a motorcycle. Okay? Okay. Sorry, I think I, I, I just. I just did the other way around because you said um, you said that if he parks three car, he won't park. Or did you say yes or no? Sorry, I, I forgot. Did you say that no, he won't park three cars in the garage, right? Right? Can you can you tell me something? Well, anyways, you see, this is my point. Okay, so we are getting a little bit overloaded. So I guess it's the right time to take a break. And uh, so I'll see you here in like five minutes. Is that fine? Okay, Mike, can you start with your stuff? You, I will. Awesome. So see you in five minutes. Mm -hmm.